Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here are your hosts, Monica Profit and Tracy Hazard. Hey everyone, welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Tracy Hazard and I have a international traveler who has no home base and he has been starting business after business. So I have Mario Nafal here and he has bootstrapped his first business at age 22. He made it first million in year one and eight figures by year two. He scaled to over 30 countries and launched many other companies, including a blockchain consulting company, which is what we're going to talk about, International Blockchain Consulting, IBC, of which he is the founder and CEO. Um, He has been through extremely difficult black swan events that we break any entrepreneur and bankrupt a business. So we're going to talk about that because those are always risky, especially when you hit on the innovation edge. He is now bootstrapping another seven-figure business and documenting the process from beginning to allow entrepreneurs full access to all marketing, logistics, product operational, financial decisions, including failures and successes. So he is an open book, and I love that because when we talk about doing some of these cutting-edge innovation things, we're, we're you know sowing new ground, and that's difficult. So thank you so much for sharing that. Welcome to the show, Mario. Pleasure, Tracy. Thank you for having me. So let's talk about some of these. So you've had multiple ventures, including IBC. So where does IBC, the International Blockchain Consulting, fall in the scope of how many ventures you've opened before that? So you said seven, but... Yeah, it- so uh, how many ventures I have? I think it's about seven. But IBC, look, in 2018, throughout the bear market, IBC kind of slowed down and it's logical. And I was lucky to have other ventures. I've hedged my risk. So a lot of the resources we had at IBC where we were hiring at one stage a person a day, and when, when, you know, when you're innovating and when there's hype at the beginning of an innovation, it starts with hype, you know, it's normal to just have that gold rush. And I was going through it. Lucky enough, I've been in business long enough to know it's short term. So in 2018, not, uh, I spent a lot of time in IBC, 2017, 2018. Bear market, moved away to the other companies. And now I'm being dragged in back to IBC because of the, uh, as soon as the sentiment improves, I don't like to say the market improves, as soon as the sentiment improves. Um, and my time kind of gets sucked in and then I'm sucking in my other senior team members out of my other companies to come with me and help. So I, I see the process happening right now, Tracy. Well, you know, that's why we're here at the New Trust Economy is that, and you know, why I write my column is because we're seeing that. We're seeing a tipping point for application use of blockchain that is high right now. Great interest in it. And it's gone beyond hype because we've seen great, really skillful and really useful applications. Are you seeing that as well? Yeah, so there's the, the Gartner hype cycle. Um, and at the moment, it's going through, I think, the trough of disillusionment, uh, according to, to Gartner. But I think this is the, you know, that, that's where reality kicks in. And that's where products are being created in the background. That's where reality sinks in. Everyone that was there for the hype starts to die down, disappear. And I've seen that happen. You know, first time I've seen it happen. And then the projects, when people come to me and say, everything in crypto is a scam, majority is a scam and that's normal. But that small percentage that's not a scam should not be ignored and should not be put in the same basket as a scam. A lot of quality, a lot of value is being created. And that's, the, that's what we're seeing right now and we'll continue to see more and more as the industry matures. Things take long. You know, the, the human mind over, I think they're over, the human mind overestimates the short-term impact of innovation underestimates the long-term value it creates. And that's what's happening in, in blockchain as well. I agree. And that's, <clears throat> that's part of why I highlight that kind of use level innovation because it starts to show people, look, there's really viable 
solutions here that are realistic, that are solving problems, that are going to take hold whether or not you like blockchain. That's irrelevant or whether or not it's, you know, it's invest, you know, it's investment worthy at this stage of the game. It doesn't matter if the use case matters the most to it being exactly what a company needs. Anything that creates value, it's inevitable that it will kick in. It's inevitable. Humans want to grow as part of what makes us human. So when we find more efficient or more pleasurable ways of doing something, if it's more efficient in terms of blockchain, we, it, will, it will just go towards that direction. Now, scams, regulations, all these things tend to slow down innovation, the conservatives and all that. They'll, they slow down. Anyone that's conservative in their mindset, not politically, they slow down innovation. But it, it's, it's just about time. It's a matter of when. And it just, you've got to be patient if you want to make the, the most value or if you're looking at monetary value, if you want to make money. Be patient and have a long-term perspective whenever you're dealing with anything innovative, blockchain yeah. or non-blockchain. Absolutely. So I found really the, the sort of services and the comprehensiveness of IBC is really interesting because on one hand, you're helping with the development and the planning, and on the other hand, you're helping with investment. So you've got both sides going on. Why is that? Why did you develop it that way? You asked the right questions. And I, was, I had a podcast a few hours ago, and I wish they asked those questions. Yeah, well, good. Um, yeah, so if you look at IBC, and, and that message would resonate with entrepreneurs. So in entrepreneurship, and I'm, even though I've got all my companies and I've done well, I'm still an entrepreneur in the way I do things in business. So when I launched IBC, the first, first step is to learn. And I'm still learning till today. I'm speaking to you because I've learned some things. I hope I can create value. But I'm still learning, and I'll always be learning. So when I first started IBC, it was talking to as many people in the industry. I was in, as you said, I traveled. So I was in Slovenia when I first started the company. And I had, my assistant was just scheduling calls from the second I wake up till, till I go to bed. And I'd be, everyone knows me in the city center because I go out of my apartment in the middle and I walk around for hours on calls. A lot of learning. Next step would be to see where I can bring value. And then I, I start offering many services, bringing people in, partnerships, etc. And then, because I don't know which service will be in demand. Obviously, when I came into the industry, 2017, I didn't know anything about ICOs were. I knew about blockchain as a technology. I had no idea about ICOs. Demand came, you know, was the crazy for ICOs. That dragged us in. A lot of development work there. Um, and then started expanding to marketing. The main focus, the one thing that stood the test of time since 2017 is helping quality projects raise money. And that's what's getting me a lot of attention now. A lot of big names, family offices. I talked about General Motors. I called with them earlier today. They're coming to me because they're looking at how they can put their money into those businesses that are creating value uh, as this innovation takes hold. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think that you having both sides is really critical. So this is what I found because I, I've worked in, in innovation for 27 years. So I have a deep experience into, into being on the cutting edge of innovation at all times, mostly on the product side of things, um, but also on the, the software and service side of things. And so as we look at that and look at what's going on, I think one of the biggest problems for companies taking in and adopting blockchain as a solution, even if it's the best solution, is that it's daunting. It's hard for you to figure out how much is this going to cost? How am I going to develop this? Do I have the right plan? So we go in with this sort of shotgun plan approach to getting funding. And then we ha still have no idea on how we're going to tackle it and get going and get moving afterwards. We're way more fundable and more likely to be successful in our investment rounds if we have that dialed in and then we have real expertise and advisors. It's true. Now, when you say that a lot of people are having that shotgun approach, when it's such a new technology, it's even for experts that I speak to that know a hundred times more than me, some of them pretend to know a lot, but they, they're still figuring it out. Yeah. So when you have startups wanting to see where they can create value, they miss, out, they miss two things. First, they don't have enough knowledge of the space um, to know what they could do right now. So when they have their shotgun approach, they're trying to figure out what to do. And those failures, that 90-something percent that fail, ignore the scans. The ones that fail, they actually are a stepping stone for the ones that succeed. Right. And that goes to my next point, which is timing. And, you know, when people start saying they want to launch Uber on the blockchain, but a lot of businesses come, with us, come to us with such grand schemes. I'm like, great if you came to us in 10 years' time. It's just too early right now. So you'll have a lot of those startups that mindset, they overestimate the short-term impact of this innovation. Guys, it's going to take, uh, guys and ladies, it's going to take a while for these things to happen. 
And that shotgun approach is these two things being missed. One is not having enough expertise, and number two, it's just not timing it right. Launching the Uber on blockchain when the protocols are not even set up. So you gotta set up the foundation first. And I think those are the businesses I've invested in. One business, I'm very, very conservative. And that, that was more you know, a foundational play. Setting up the technology, like you said, you've been in, in innovation for 27 years. I was gonna say earlier when we were chatting, I'd love to speak to someone. I'd love to speak to people that witnessed the dot-com boom more than I have. I'm still, yeah. I'm 29. That was so me. Was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. How, how much similarities are they? From so what this I read. Is, this is why I started this podcast because not only did I witness that happen back then and I'm seeing it now, but there were so many great companies that went under because they couldn't get funded because of the hype cycle. And they were fabulous companies who deserve to make it. Um, we scraped by, but we also had a couple of, you know, world issues that happened. So here we are in the midst of the dot-com com bust at the same time that 9-11 happens. And so, you know, the bottom was falling out of even stable businesses. So we had a lot of other mixed things happen. But, you know, you could argue that the same thing's happening now. We've got, you know, national disasters and, you know, weather disasters going on and we've earthquakes around the world and, You've got tariffs and disruption and trade wars. So you actually do have similar environmental issues as well. But we're seeing that. But then I got myself into 3D printing at 2009, right at the height of it. And then it had a, uh, went right into the trough of disillusionment as well. And yet we kept going and we were produced, we produced over 560 podcasts and we had audiences growing day after day after day where when we stopped recording, we had a hundred thousand listeners per month. And so, you know, when it was, it, and we still occasionally record, if we found something really interesting, we just occasionally add to it because our listeners care. And so we want to make sure that they have it. They, did, they stayed subscribed. They didn't unsubscribe. And so what it happens is that we see that same thing that happened in 3D printing is the companies that were built on great foundations with great use cases, with absolute filling a need, some of them went out of business because their business practices weren't there and their funding dried up. But for the most part, the ones that succeeded were meant to succeed and they are still going strong and they are still um, doing viable business in what they do. What we find out was what we wanted to do wasn't viable, but our information was viable. That was what people wanted from us was information. So we gave it to them until they didn't want it anymore. So. Uh, and and positioned you it had an incredible position as the market. It's a long-term position. If you have a long-term view, anyone in blockchain right now, that kept recording, recording their podcast, for example, Ivan on tech, I'll speak it to him. And he kept going through day by day, every morning he records. The market went down considerably, people tuned out. He kept recording and, and you've done the same thing and you're doing the same thing. And that's what the Amazons and the Jeff Bezos and the Googles did. No matter what happened during the dot-com bubble, they kept building their business. And that's what counts. That's what, you know, Amazon is a perfect example that everyone likes to mention. It goes back to your point as well. How many failed Amazons were they back in the dot-com boom? When I say failed Amazons, I really mean it. Failed Amazons, a strong team just as good as Jeff Bezos' team. A great product as well, a great vision. But there's so many factors that could play a role, whether they didn't meet the right investor, whether they didn't time it properly, they gave up too early, they just had bad luck. It's just part of the process and it tends to repeat itself again and again and again. Yeah, and you, you're right. Timing is very critical in any kind of business development, product development. It is the most critical factor and recognizing that. But also, I, I have seen that stealing yourself and, and so building a foundational business underneath it so that you can ride the wave because things will happen over the course of the time that's right for you is, is really critically important. So I actually want to touch on that. So I have my part of why I'm doing the podcast is that I'm exploring and, and trying to understand and learn because this is part of my learning process. Um, learn about whether or not this has great application for my podcast production company. So I've been really transparent with my listeners about that. They know that. And so uh, what we're doing is we're building the Google AdWords for podcasters. And so we, we're building an ad mixing system. We have all of this technology. We already built it. As you know, as I mentioned earlier, we have over 200 customers. So we have a really foundational business that makes money every single day. We have high profit margins. But do I want to shift and add a blockchain underneath it? It's been something that I've been, I've been exploring because if I'm going to build Google AdWords, why do I want to make the same mistakes that Google made? 
why do I not want to make a more trustworthy ad platform? Why do I not want to make a more distributed ledger style um, ability for exchange of information? I was just talking, yeah, uh, the last interview that I did was with Sphere Identity, and we're talking about logins without forms, where podcasters could control their identities. They could share it with the advertisers they were interested in, but not share it with the general public choices being made about about all of those could be much more facilitated on the blockchain. But in evaluating that, what I have not yet found and curious as to whether or not your company fits this role is someone who could really look at that with me and say, I think your instincts are right, Tracy. I think you've got something viable that really belongs on the blockchain. Let's talk about what that looks like and how you develop that. And I've yet to find that advisor in the process. Is that part of what your company is providing? Let's look at the tokenomics, 100%. And what I've tried to do, and it was hard in 2018 because we're hiring one person a day, so vetting the people is really tough. Someone who's going to be very brutal with you, that if it, tokenomics don't fit, they'll say, hey, you know, it just doesn't make sense. Or if it fits, yes, it's a great application, but wait another year. The protocols are not ready for it. A about the timing aspect. Yeah. And now the people that I have around me, are, I try to get people as direct as I am because that's what the, the space needs. And also, because we connect projects to investors. If we go to our investor with a project that you know, is too early or the tokenomics don't make sense, if we haven't been able to spot it, the investor will be like, Mario, isn't this too early? Why, you, why is your team bringing me this project? So you have to look at the incentives of whoever you work with. So from our case, I've been open about our incentives. Our incentive is to please our investors because without them, we, our business is not as solid as it is. And in your case, find someone with IBC or someone else. I, I, I can connect you to many people. For me, I'm just doing a podcast, bringing value, not about business. So I can connect you to people who are very direct and will actually give you um, that advice if their incentives are aligned. Now, if you go to someone, they do development work. They'll give you a million reasons why it's a good idea to go on the blockchain. Because they're, they're selling you development work, right? Exactly. It's all about incentives. You know, Charlie Munger said it really well. Incentives is one of the most powerful things in business. Um, so find someone that their incentive is not to get your money if you say yes to convince you to do that so and that's number one number two even people with the right without any incentive to convince you they're very opinionated those people are re it's really important to avoid them because if they believe something and they're not self-aware enough to question their own beliefs and change their mind they could they could especially in the early stages where everyone's still learning they could drag you down a really dangerous path so for anyone looking at the block, the application of blockchain in their business, look for two things, the incentive of the person that's giving you advice and them as a personality. How opinionated are they? Are they someone who pretend they know everything and then they'll give you advice because they think they know everything? Or are they someone learning with you and exploring it with you and they'll ask the questions with you and then try to find the answers? If you find those two things, you'll have an advisor um, that will really – give you invaluable advice at this early stage. And yeah, you absolutely. Advice. I agree. I'm so glad you said that. So let's talk a little bit about you deciding what's innovative and what interests you. How did you get into, I mean, you said that you were, you know, you really didn't have a lot of information on ICOs. You didn't have background here, awesome. right? What made you decide that it was worth building a business and, and exploring? And you've done that multiple times across other businesses. So maybe you can mention some of those other ones as well, but you've made that decision to go down an innovative path to, you know, to try something new. What intrigues you? How do you decide that this is worth exploring? Okay. So now, you mentioned about timing. I'd recommend anyone listening to look up. I always recommend this. Bill Gross, G-R-O-S-S. -S, you might have heard the name. Yep. And he has a TED speech where he talks about timing. He compares timing to your team, your product, your funding, your business plan, um, all these different things. So five or six, five things, I think. And timing was the most important factor in a business's success. That's how important it is. And I've realized after watching the interview, that's, that's how I do business. I try to look at the industry and get in at the right time. So not only getting into an industry, but the approach I have. So that's a, a quick note about timing. Now, about me and innovation. I want to mention a quick comment about innovation in general. Innovation is so valuable if done right. It could build a, multi, a unicorn business. But at the same time, it could also be the quickest way to failure. And that sounds scary because it's a high-risk approach. When you're going down a path, that's just innovating means everyone is learning, man. It means, you know, there's, whenever there's opportunity for high returns, you know, common sense, it's going to have high risk. That's it. 
So you try to, I try to mitigate my risk. And the way I do that is I dip my toes in the water. So when I got into, I'll, I'll, start, I'll use IBC as an example. I knew about blockchain. In ICOs, I had no idea. I learned it from these calls that I had. I'm like, all right, I want to get into this space. I want something new and I want to step outside my comfort zone. You know, I did banking and finance in university. Yeah, all my companies are in e-commerce, some consulting. So I, I started IBC and I started learning. I knew the value proposition was so obvious that I knew that if I plant the seeds now, it will pay off in five years time. Didn't expect it to get seven figures in six months, but that's what happens with hypes. But I, I, I had a long-term view of the industry. And then, so that was my approach. If that brings value to anyone is dip your toes, learn as much as you can, but plant that seed, whether it's through a podcast, through a blog, you're positioning yourself early on in the industry with little risk. Now you can go all in, just do it with the investor's money. Don't risk your house on that. Yeah. <laughs> so that would be my two cents on innovation and how I look at it. I just like to mitigate my risk because I, I just want to sleep well at night and, and I want to have a well, comfortable you, life. Mari, I really appreciate you saying that. So my, my listeners have heard me say multiple times again, because I have another show called Product Launch Hazards, of course, because that's my last name, but it's all about those risks, right? Those risks that happen. And the number one thing we talk about is doing what we call market proof testing early on, which is exactly what you do by dipping your toe in your right. You're checking the market. And sometimes you don't have, because it's not created yet. The only thing you could do is have conversations about it. You can't show them something or you have to go all in, right? And so that's, you know, having that opportunity to have conversations with the right market or the right people will help you figure out whether or not this is worth doing. That's exactly what we did in 3D printing. It's why we didn't go into business. <laughs> And not only if it's worth doing, how to approach it. Like I had no idea about ICOs, but ICOs gave me that boost to get our company such a, in such a position. Now, when I say ICOs, doing it legitimately, working with quality projects that still exist today. And that, that gave us such awareness. Um, so not only if, but how. Where is the opportunity? Because blockchain is a very wide term. If we got into enterprise blockchain back in 2017, I would not be where I am today. At least IBC wouldn't be where it is today. Um, so I, and Jim Collins talks about that, um, approach as well, the dipping your toes. He, he calls it in his book, good to great, great book, um, throwing pebbles. And then when a pebble hits, go ahead with the cannonball. Yeah. And I do this with everything. It's a lean approach to business and it's, it's but honestly it is, a good it approach. It is an e-commerce approach, which is where you started, right? I mean, there's always A-B testing. There's always market testing, right? And, and that's where you come to conversion rates and all of these things that are indicators that things are working. What we think in innovation, though, is that, I mean, the inventor's mindset is usually in this place of, well, they haven't seen it yet. But there is always it, little things that you can test along the way. They just ignore it because they, they are all on. If I don't show them exactly what it is, they didn't get it. It's always about testing different things, seeing what works. Um, and, um, and, and I'm doing it right now. You mentioned it's an e-commerce uh, strategy. 100%. Right now, a week ago, I'm like, you know what? I have a business in, in health and wellness that sells high-end kitchen appliances. That was my first business. That's the one that you said, get seven figures year one, eight figures year two, 30 countries. That was it, fruity. Now, um, the way I, I uh, the business I have now, I had an idea last week. I'm like, you know what? It's all about the customer now in e-commerce. So it's about having, it's about lifetime value. The business that will win, the business that will be able to afford to pay the most for paid campaign, paid acquisition. I won't go down too deep in that rabbit hole, but very broadly, is the one that will have the longest lifetime value, the most valuable lifetime value of the customer. And that's where customer service comes in and the power of giving away free product. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to double. I've been doing this for a while. I'm going to double down. I will launch a website that will offer health and wellness products, um, like nice raw chocolates, organic chocolates, all the, and lollies and, and snacks to the clients. Now, the way I did it is that lean approach. Instead of opening a great website, making deals with partners, spending all that time, I found suppliers and got their wholesale list. I don't have even anything signed with them yet. Nothing. I've got their wholesale prices. I said to the guy, find out the best selling products. I'm like, all right, these, this is it. Got a list of them, four suppliers. That's their best selling products. Put them onto a list, gave it, got a VA, put it on the Shopify website, got developers to do a Shopify website. In one week, the website is going live in two days with all the coolest products in a very simple, clean website. And then we'll be sending out an email blast to our database, giving them a 10% discount. And we'll see how many buy. We don't even have the product. We don't even have an agreement with the suppliers. But it will give me a, that, that pebble. Will let me see if people are buying. Perfect. 
Get the agreements done. You have 24 hours. Get the products in stock. Send it to the customers. Let's double down. Double down on the ads and expand. IBC was the same. As soon as we got our first client, as soon as you get someone as an entrepreneur that gives you that first $10, when you get a podcast, as soon as you have those 10, 100 viewers that say, hey, great podcast, double down because you're on to Move something. Move it forward. It's, right. Exactly. It's, it's difficult to get that initial, uh, initial pebble to hit. It's really, really difficult in business. There's millions of people try, competing with you or thousands depending on the industry. So for you to actually get someone to pay you your, their money and not pay someone else means you've done something right. Find out what it is and double down on it, especially when it comes to innovation where risk is really high. Where risk is really high. Absolutely. We, we love to do that. We call it, when I give my lectures on market proof testing, we call that one sell anything, right? Anything in the category, anything in the next, especially if you don't own it, that's even better because you haven't, you haven't gone deep into inventory. You can spend all of your testing on the market side of things. So we love that approach. Um, that, that really works. So and tell them, tell them not to worry about making money. Yeah. Test yeah. the market, to make money later on. That's right. Absolutely. That's a, I like to go net zero rather than lose money in the process. But if you can, go, yeah, if you can go net zero, 100%. you learn something. It's perfect. Right. And sometimes yeah. you'll find some of those products sing and you make money, which funds your venture. And then you don't have to go for that crowdfunding round. And if you make money on that, on the, on those pebbles it means you need to double down like crazy. Yeah, like but I had, <laughs> you'll, have, you'll always have those people around you that will say, what are you doing? You're not making any profit. My CFO called me. He's like, Mario, are you doing this again, launching a business without a profit? About two hours ago, I got a voice note from him. You'll have those people around you that will not understand that approach. But it's the approach that works. And I'm, I'm completely open about it. I'm even documenting it. As you said, I'm documenting my new business. I'm actually filming myself do it. I'm like, hey, if I fail, I'll fail on camera. If I succeed, you'll watch me succeed. And to show people that this is the way to do it. I'm surprised not everyone does it. Yeah, absolutely. Everyone will have links to that. So you'll be able to watch Mario. Um, so we'll have links to all of his uh, ongoing ventures that he's going live with. Um, you know, let's talk a little bit about trust because this is the new trust economy. And you were talking a bit about the scams and the other things that come through. I think we're really skeptical nowadays, especially in that sort of blockchain ICO world, right? Um, because there's been so many uh, scams and issues. It is common in all businesses. There's lots of e-commerce scams. There's lots of scams in just about every business I've ever worked in or worked with. So it's not uncommon and it's not unexpected. But how do you identify them? And have you tripped on some that have really almost destroyed your business? Oh, yeah. I love yeah. to talk about scams because I've seen so many. I have, there's one uh, crypto, uh, crypto 101, some podcast I did. Uh, yeah, Crypto 101. And he called me. I know Aaron well. He called me. All he wanted to ask is about all the scams I've been through because he's heard about them. So I've seen it all. Now, about scams in an industry like crypto. Scams and hacks will happen all the time. That was the Binance hack that happened two weeks ago. Everyone was like, Mario, can you make a video about it? Mario, what's the thing about Binance? I made a video saying I don't care about it. I, don't, I completely ignored it because it's expected. There will be another Binance hack. The industry is maturing. So there is a lot more scams in crypto than, than most spaces out there. There's a lot more scams in cannabis, uh, at least in the early stages, than anything out there. There's a lot more scams right now in other illicit activities that you know, you're not going to be able to trust anyone there. Reason is very simple. There are no regulations. or regulations are still maturing. Regulations like it's in also Mohaven, lack of knowledge, I think, too. So that's, you know, there's a comment, there's a, a thread between lack of regulation and lack of knowledge. Very good point. Yeah, lack of knowledge and regulation. So, with regulations and, and knowledge as well, I think knowledge is the most important thing. His podcast or uh, Amir Rozic and his Block Geeks the courses he teaches people about blockchain is so crucial. Now, some people just don't have the time to learn. Like I, we have the time because we're involved. People, someone that works nine to five and then goes and does another job and then wants to get involved and hears about Bitcoin, doesn't have time to even understand what Bitcoin is. So, they rely on regulators to say, hey, this is safe. That's why there's so many loopholes, not loopholes, so many um, um, regulations to follow for startups raising money. You know, you have to have a legitimate team. You have to have a business plan. You can't make, you can't have advisors not saying they're advisors. You have to follow these uh, regulations are not perfect, but there's some basic things there to avoid scams. So when there are no regulations and I'm a partner at a law firm in blockchain, because I know the importance of following regulations, number one, the space will not mature. And number two, there will be a lot of scams. And then when regulators start catching up and then scammers will see, oh, these guys are getting subpoenas. Shit, I cannot do I this. Not, I've, yeah, I better yeah. change the way I do it. Exactly. 
he said, oh, have I been scammed? One person that wanted to partner with us, he was working with our CEO at the time and he started taking our clients afterwards and we sent him a legal letter, etc. Then he ended up in jail because he scammed other people. Uh, he actually ended up in jail. So when these things happen, um, and he's in the media, when these things happen, others will wake up and realize that, hey, regulators are still there and they're gonna, whether it's crypto or non-crypto, scams will not work in any industry. So there were, there were clear regulations were not there. That's number one. Number two, hypes. People want to make quick money. And number three, education. No one understood. I would say education about raising money. It's been around for a long time. ICOs essentially took advantage of raising money from the public. Well, that's already there. It's called Reg CF, Regulation CF by right. Obama, the Jobs Act by, by right. Obama. Right, so crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding, right? And that, equity crowdfunding, yeah. yeah. And that's, there's a lot of potential there. And I think, again, long term. Um, I want to get involved in it and um, we offer that service as well. And I know a lot of people in the space, but people thought that utility tokens were not securities and they could do it without following those regulations because it's a utility token. No, right. it's a token still to raise money. You have to follow the same regulations. And uh, it took a, a while for regulators to make that clear. If at least some people argue that. And that's why there were so many scams. Now this is normal. There were a lot of scams, but as I said earlier, I'm not sure if I said it when the recording was on or not, when there's, there's 90 something percent scams in the industry, there's still that small percentage that are quality projects that kept building while everyone's screaming, scam, 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 I got scammed, these ICOs are scam, ICOs are dead. They're laughing in the background. We say, hey, we made our millions, not made it. We raised millions and we have an incredible product that's about to go live. So value was being created. A lot of value, a lot of gems came out of the ICO boom. A lot of gems will continue to come out of any other funding mechanism. It's just a normal part of the evolution of any innovative um, industry. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Mario, is there anything else that you really want our listeners and, and my readers to know about investing in innovation and how you become a successful serial entrepreneur? Cool. So about becoming a successful serial entrepreneur, there's a lot of things you could learn. I've only started teaching those things recently, mainly for free on my channels, etc. cetera. Um, and not trying to plug it. I'm saying this because there's a lot you need to learn. There's no formula for success. But I think the, the point that we've touched on about the timing is just so important. Before you do anything, before you get funding, before you build the right team, before you come up with an incredible product, before you learn how to manage a team, you learn the importance of meetings, all the different things that I talk about on various podcasts, nothing matters. Make sure you get into the industry at the right time. If you got into blockchain in 2011 and got out in 2015, you know, you know, it's not the best place to be. If you get into blockchain 10 years from now, the returns will not be the same as if you get in right now. So getting in early uh, when there's something innovative going on in any industry, Whenever some innovation is happening, it doesn't have to be an innovative technology. It could be an innovation in, in the, regulate, the way that something's being regulated, like cannabis. You know, regulators are innovating their technology or catching up. But yeah. more broadly, innovative technologies to get involved, make sure you get in at the right time, hedge yourself because there's high risk. But if you get in and you do things right, the returns over the long run, patience, patience, patience. Is, is significantly more than getting into something traditional where you can make quick money. So ignore short-term returns, have a long-term view, look at what you're going to make in five, 10 years time and position yourself. It takes time, especially if you're young, you've got time. So position yourself and create value. Mario, thank you so much for joining us today. I, uh, Mario Nafal, um, you guys will have all the links, everything to be able to find him, to follow him, to watch what he's working on and doing. Um, that will be in the blog post for newtrusteconomy.com. And of course, you can follow us on social media at New Trust Economy, and we'll be, we'll be sharing out posts and, and keep following what Mario is working on. Thank you, Mario. I really appreciate you joining me today. Thanks for having me, Tracy. Everyone, this has been Tracy Hazard on the new Trust Economy. See you next time. You've been listening to the new Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring the new Trust Economy with us.